what I'm going to try to do through a combination of slides and my voice, um, give you a feeling for Christiansburg Institute. Uh, 100 years and bring you into where we are today. Now that is a tall order and I like to talk, so I'm gonna try to, I have notes here to cue me, and I'm going to try to start at the beginning, however, because I think that to understand and appreciate the evolution of Christiansburg Institute through its 100 years requires that we start at the very, very beginning. The power, of, that's the power of it and the energy of it. And Mary Jane is going to help me here by pushing buttons. We don't, we at Christiansburg Institute have not quite afforded the remotes and all of the things, but we'll get there one day. I think the, the, what you're seeing on the screen, and she will hold it for a while while I make a few words about this, is the first Christiansburg Institute. Uh, we don't know whether it was called that right at that time because most of our documentation of the Institute comes from the Quakers who were not quite that active uh, in the beginning of the, of the school's life. It was a, an initiation of the Federal Freedmen's Bureau and one of their agents actually founded the school and that was Charles Schaefer. Charles Schaefer was a remarkable man he was an ardent abolitionist who at the end of the Civil War determined to give his life to the supporting of the recently freed people uh, in term, in, as a minister and as a teacher. He was a Baptist minister, he was a northerner, came from Pens Germantown, Pennsylvania, but he was also a qualified educator. Uh, he came in, 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 in the year of, in August 1866, purchased the small log cabin that you just saw, added the second story, and began to create the space. Several things happened to him. Number one is his, he was shot, <laughs> gunshot, went right through his hat. And it, it, you don't know whether it was just a poor uh, shooter or an accident, but the point was it, it nearly missed his head and he would not have been with us had that happened. Uh, he didn't have a great deal of difficulty, Re rather typically of, this, of what was going on with these new schools for the Fed Federal Freedmen's Bureau. There was a tremendous amount of local resistance throughout the South. Uh, they were usually burned down, all kinds of things, and that didn't occur in Montgomery County. What they did do was to refuse to sell him building materials. And already he had engaged the African American community, the people who had just been relieved, he described them in his diary as in pitiable conditions. They were living in mud, mud and twig huts. They were existing wherever they could in ragged clothes. But he was able to get them to go and purchase the nails and the wood that he needed. They took that risk. And so that was how the cabin got remodeled and the work got done. Uh, Rather typical of our public policy, I would say, having gone through the anti-poverty program in New York City, federal government was quite famous, is, is, could, still remains famous for its wonderful initiatives, three years, close it out, people get tumbled out of jobs as they get lured in, um, and of course, as we know, the Reconstruction era dollar investment ceased in 1869, and education then came under the Morrill Act, which was compulsory education for uh, all American citizens and for the first time public education throughout the South. Uh, Schaefer though had just gotten his experiment underway. He, was, he, was, he had built a church. He was just very impressed with the commitment of the community and he decided to stay. So through his endeavors, Christiansburg Institute became a significant institution. He solicited Northern philanthropists, mostly religion-based, and among those, of course, were the Quakers, who had contributed to more than over 100 schools throughout the South, just immediately following the war. Under the take, under, with the Quakers at the helm, uh, an, 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 hold it, Mary Jane, because an interim building was built, 
And um, it was a very nice four, st uh, four uh, three classroom uh, building, a single story, a very attractive little building. And it also served as the church. But the school population was growing and it was crowding. And then the third school building was built in 1884. And you can see that this is a remarkable school for in this, in this area during this time. This was 18, this was 1884. And there it is, it, it survives today as the Christiansburg Community Center. It's a remarkable building, strong, five classrooms, teachers offices, and a meeting room that could seat the entire school population. And at this time, the Friend Freedmen's Association were, act, were acting as the board of managers guaranteeing the financial security and stability of Christiansburg Institute. Interestingly enough, today I'm proud to say that this is where the CI offices are. We're on the second floor of that building. And uh, it, we walk, I walk into my office each day, and on the landing of this, these unbelievable, I guess, 15 feet ceilings on the first floor, uh, there is a picture of Charles Marshall, who was one of, and I'll talk a little bit about him later, but I'll tell you many a day, when I've been grumbling and mumbling and I look at this man and I thought, listen, if you can do what you did, I can manage to get up these steps and continue my work and dedicate myself to the cause of the revival. Uh, the Quakers continued to grow the school. They, they became quite enamored. You know, they had founded Hampton Institute. And uh, the, the excitement of Schaefer and the growth of the school in Christiansburg really lured them into believing that Christiansburg Institute, if appropriately managed and staffed and financed, could become the Hampton in the West. And uh, they, they kept this as a dream and they carried the school very well. Schaefer left, they introduced African American principles, which they had quite a strong conviction about. Uh, feeling that if the African American communities were going to grow, they had to not only teach, and they, uh, Schaefer had been training teachers, but they had to learn to run their own educational systems. Um, of course, along comes Booker T. Washington, who became well known, and the Quakers then began to, to think in terms of bringing Booker T. Washington's uh, skills and his model to Christiansburg. Uh, he was reluctant at first. He felt that they would never be able to have a higher education institution here because there weren't enough African Americans. And you, you needed a local commuter population in order to sustain a, a college. Uh, but he uh, did take on the job. And in 1896, Booker T. Washington appointed a team of his graduates to come to Christiansburg Institute. The leader of that team was Charles Marshall. Charles Marshall was 29 years old, the oldest one of the five. And this team, had the, they had the mission to grow Christiansburg Institute by, uh, it, by it, through the Booker T. Washington and into a boarding school. And that they did with a vengeance. Interestingly enough, the, the team did not all come in. Uh, Charles Marshall was at Prairie View, Texas, um, and he had just settled into a very nice job. And for those of you who know African American education, Prairie View became a very outstanding, um, Af one of the historic black colleges in the state of Texas. But he, his mentor, Booker T. Washington, and his gratitude for his Tuskegee experience, he in fact, uh, when the call came, he followed it. Uh, he took him, it took him a little while to get here, and they wanted a school teacher in, in 1895. And a very petite, absolutely beautiful young woman named Anna Patterson uh, came up here by herself leading the team. Marshall came in with his wife and sister-in-law, and the other member of the team was Edgar A. Long. And Edgar A. Long was the last member to arrive because he had not studied agriculture, and he had to go to Tuskegee for a year to become a, a well-educated in that discipline and be able to teach agriculture. This team by 1900 had purchased the mansion house 
It was an old plantation, rather abandoned and somewhat run down, with 67 acres of land. And we have remarkable documentation, worth a lecture in and of itself, of how these five people taught, plowed, built buildings, and launched the farm campus. At the same time, they were running the elementary school, and all of the, all of the coursework was being done by them over at the Hill Academy. I'm trying to stay, keep from talking too much. So <laughs> I'm not usually, I don't usually, most people who have heard me present before really have not, hardly have ever seen me look at my notes so carefully, but I do want, want to move through this rapidly so that you, I can engage you in an exchange about the school and you can get at some of the questions that maybe you that have been built up in your mind as we have made a very concerted effort over the years that I've been involved with the Alumni Association to introduce the school reintroduce it to the public. The uh, turning point in the growth and the realization of the dream occurred in 1902 when three major buildings were uh, actually put on the campus. One is the barn and you can see that this, this is the old barn and it was there when the, when the school went up for auction. Uh, but it, it is the same roof and the line and the, the attractiveness of the barn. You can see architecturally is just a repetition of what was there. Uh, the other was a trades building. And, and trades as we think of them today and the way they were defined historically, as you all know in this room, probably quite different. Uh, the Christiansburg Institute had some of the traditional things that we call trades, carpentry, mechanics, uh, but they also had printing and teaching itself was considered a trade. So that it went through the whole training process and all of these were going on within Christiansburg Institute. And the other building, the Quakers were somewhat reluctant to take on so many buildings at once, was Mars Hall, the boys dormitory. When they had uh, restored the mansion house and renovated it. They renovated the remaining slave cabins and that was where the male students had to live. And Marshall made a very persuasive plea about getting them out of that, out of the slave cabins. Some of them had been enslaved. Some of them, all were the, mostly the children of slaves and he felt that it was really demoralizing to, to, be, to be haunted by the memory, the, the, the lack of air, just they had remodeled them but there were all of these memories. And with his plea the Quakers said, okay, all right, <laughs> in our vernacular, all right already, let's, let's do it. And Mars Hall, the Boys Dormitory, was built in 1902. And I think that the, the whole exchange, we have the Quaker Minutes, uh, they met monthly, each of the Quaker, each month they had a report from the principals. Uh, it was a true collaboration. It was, it was uh, a dialogue. It was because the mission was so completely shared by those extremely aristocratic, very well educated and mostly very wealthy white men in Philadelphia and the Booker T. Washington team in Christiansburg. The respect was mutual. They were almost in awe of them. And uh, you know, people, for example, among the Quakers, Isaac Sharpless, who was the president of Haverford College, sat on the board of managers. And I, I bring out who they were because they instilled a quality of education and development that was that was rarely seen in rural places, but definitely in the rural South following the Civil War. And so this was an amazing, the school had energy and vitality that was imbued with a vast experience. And uh, I think it shows up not only in the way that uh, the school grew, but it shows up in terms of, of, the, of, of the instilling of values, for example, uh, I'm looking at Charles Johnson and looking at Bill Brown. We're all alums. And B, did you, did you go to CI? Of course. Of course. Yes. I didn't know. I haven't seen you in the meetings lately, but uh, 
the th we can all say that we were very proud and we got a very, we felt a very particular kind of investment that even going around into other high schools, African Americans, we did not see the same. So a tradition was, bred, was actually bred there and sustained over the years. Charles Marshall developed appendicitis and died in 1906 at the age of 39. Um, and uh, that left his very close friend and his assistant principal who served all kinds of roles, Edgar A. Long, in charge of Christiansburg Institute. In his letters, and we have a lot of Edgar E. Long's writings, the alumni had gotten them quite a while ago from his daughter, uh, Audrey Long Whitlock. Uh, he talks about how committed he was to fulfilling the blueprint that Charles Marshall had laid down for him. And he did it with a zeal and an energy that was just almost unbelievable. Um, the, the, the Quakers were as proud of him as he was proud to step in and fulfill this mission. In, in, um, in 1908, uh, the, one of the key, another key building was put on campus, the flagship building, is the Bailey Mars Hall. And just take a study it carefully because it's a remarkable dwelling, isn't it? Absolutely remarkable. And it, it housed the women on the third and fourth floors. It had, it had an auditorium to seat 250 students. On the ground floor was the dining room and uh, it had administrative offices and at one time it had the library there. But it's a building that we all loved. It became the cultural center of the New River Valley in terms of music and plays and lectures from all over the country were there. The great tenor Roland Hayes was there. Oscar de Priest, the congressman, was there. Uh, so it was the place that you could go and it, was, it, it gave a vitality and energy to, to we who came from places like Elliston, Shawsville, Pulaski, Radford. Um, Long's energy and commitment to the community was well known. His relationships with both the black and white community were remarkable. And in 1919, he, he, he with the support of people like Dr. Showalter, Eggleston, the president of Virginia Tech, they took on the task of building a, a hospital. African Americans had no health care services. Uh, our pictures are sort of blurred, and uh, as you can see. Uh, we are now uncovering much more, uh, a much clearer uh, photographic documentation, but we haven't had a chance to convert them to slides. And these, most of, when you see these fuzzy images, we have pulled them primarily from uh, yearbooks that the students had uh, over the years and with poor camera ships. So forgive us that, but the hospital was a remarkable building. It in essence failed as a hospital. They had mechanical difficulties, there was a fire, and of course they did not have the cost. It was a very costly building. But during this three, actually five, oh, nearly five years of operation, I, I don't have a note here, no, four years uh, of operation, it in fact managed to um, offer surgical and medical service as well as train nurses. And those nurses in fact began to staff the Barrow Memorial Hospital. So uh, it, the whole integration of economic independence and academic and educational excellence uh, was just a quest with a passion with Long. Long became an outstanding statewide educator. We found out that he headed the Negro uh, Teachers Association statewide and we have a lot of his lectures so we, we, his educational philosophy is well documented at this time. And uh, he's an amazing man. Uh, as I mentioned before, the uh, Christiansburg Institute became uh, an institute given the normal certif certification to teachers back in the 18, 1890s. Uh, but Long took that into statewide summer education programs. And they were uh, one of three sites in the state of Virginia where school teachers could go during the summer 
and work towards their normal certificate. Uh, the first ones, the first institutes were held rather locally, but in 1908 he pulled a statewide. And we'd like to note that in 1910 Radford University was founded <laughs> for the education of white women as teachers. I don't, we don't know that that was a great connection, but I think there was. Um, Long became ill in 1922. A lot of people say it's because of the failure of the hospital. Uh, and uh, his health began to fade, and he uh, died in 1924. Uh, in the interim, his wife, Anna Long, who had served at his side, became his bride, the little Anna Patterson, uh, early on when shortly, I don't know, before they went over to the farm campus. Uh, she served as principal, and um, he was not able to fulfill the blueprint. But in 1927, uh, under the leadership of Abraham Walker, uh, the, the classroom building, the Edgar and Long building, was built. Now this is, the, this is the building that we dwell on today, and we have one of the worst photographic images of this building. And I, it's just because of making slides and keeping up with the vast amount of archival data that pours in, and the, we're just understaffed, we're overworked. Uh, and so please forgive that, but I had to give you a feeling for that building because that became a classroom building with state-of-the-art science laboratory uh, and uh, actually served Christiansburg Institutes until 1966 when the building was in fact closed. 1934 was a critical year in Christiansburg, in Christiansburg Institute's life. Uh, the Quakers had, first of all, the Depression was pulling hard at them. The cost of education was escalating. Uh, but also they were very much aware of Charles Houston's work, who really felt that somewhere we, African Americans had to tackle segregation and get rid of it if we were ever going to have education, jobs, uh, it just had to be done. And so they debated as to whether they were actually de delaying uh, counties and governments throughout the South taking responsibility for education for African Americans. Because here they were building the buildings, <laughs> um, doing all kinds of remarkable things, and the county was paying two and three dollars per capita for people to be educated, which could not in fact have run Christiansburg Institute. So they conceived of and promoted the notion that Christiansburg Institute should become a regional school. Um, their deliberations are really quite remarkable. They knew that Montgomery County did not have the tax base and the resources to support an institution like Christiansburg Institute. And they felt that if, they, if all of the counties, city of Radford, Pulaski, and Montgomery would pool their resources, they could probably sustain the school with the quality of education that had been offered there. So two things happened in 1934. The Quakers gave the Hill School, which I showed you the third building, to Montgomery County for $1 to serve as the public, the elementary school. And uh, that meant then that Montgomery County only had to run a secondary school, whereas Long and Walker and Marshall ran the entire uh, first through high school graduation programs. Um, they also, uh, the regional concept, they finally uh, got agreement to. And for the first time in the history of African American education in Montgomery County, uh, our education came under the leadership of Montgomery County. Um, I, we have a wonderful interview of a woman who was in class and Abraham Walker walked from classroom to classroom when this deal was actually signed. And she says, she's, she said, uh, I said, how did you feel? She said, we knew our education was over now. And that, that was the distance, that was the agony, that was some of the, the fear, the fear. What happened to Christiansburg Institute, that it did, it did survive and it remained a boarding school 
uh, until 19, I think it's 1951 when the dormitories were finally co closed. I, w I had already gone off to college and I wasn't around at that time. But uh, in 1947, the Quakers finally deeded over the farm campus, all of its buildings and all of its property. With nine acres, well, they, dealt, they, they had already sold off a few acres. Uh, Edgar A. Long's house was built there, Abraham Walker's house, and some other parcel of land. But they, in fact, gave that over to Montgomery County for one dollar. And uh, the school then persisted. Its program altered. For example, uh, in 1926, German, French, and Latin were taught. But what did happen is that the uh, program qualified students for college placement anywhere. If you graduated Christiansburg Institute, you could walk into Howard University, Fisk University. My sister was accepted at Mount Holyoke because we did have foreign languages, we did have chemistry. Uh, we were able to qualify. Think about Christiansburg Institute in this light. In Whitfield County, the entire high school curriculum was taught in one room by one teacher until 1951. At Douglas High School, which was financed by the Tennessee, Bristol, Tennessee and Bristol, Virginia, they, they never offered a foreign language until desegregation. So that meant that a lot of students getting a secondary diploma had to, in fact, uh, forego going to college because they did not have an adequate education. The loyalty and the belief in Christiansburg Institute, I think, is, is well deserved because it really did prepare us to move wherever we had the capability, the finance, and the understanding to move. Uh, money held a lot of us back, but certainly our education uh, would, would never be a barrier. Um, the, Massive resistance yielded some gain to Christiansburg Institute. For the first time in its history, it had a gymnasium, right? <laughs> I'm looking at these youngsters in the crowd here, and they, they are smiling because they had terrific athletic programs, and they became outstanding basketball players. Christiansburg Institute had a football team, but we also had tennis courts, and I think that's the Quakers' influence. <laughs> the sports were not as valued at the, at, in the educational program, but certainly was very much valued by the students. So the gymnasium was built and also the Friends Elementary School was built. Uh, and at that time, Christiansburg Institute was given to Schaefer, uh, was given to Schaefer Memorial Baptist Church and became a community center. The closing of Christiansburg Institute, probably those of you who were around in 1966 know much more about it than I did. Um, I do know that it was a pretty drastic and uh, it was an abortion. Uh, there was no effort to save the buildings. Uh, they went up for auction. Air of the school was closed. Um, a lot of the properties were immediately sold. The slate roofs on all of the buildings were sold. And of all of the buildings, I think the flagship building had most of the brass, copper, and other things that just made it uh, you know, a flea market for people who wanted building materials. And uh, of course, with no roof, uh, the rains came in and the building just collapsed. It had to be bulldozed, finally. Uh, but that was really for commercial purposes. Uh, the, um, the agony of that, I think, was met in a variety of ways. I confess mine as cynicism. I didn't even bat an eye when my cousin was saying, you know what, they sold Christiansburg Institute, now they're tearing down the buildings. I said, what could you expect? I, harboring my, under, my wonderful career in my northeastern cities, uh, completely proud of myself, uh, not, in, not in a self way, but in a, in a way of uh, enjoying the benefits of the country uh, in a, that, that had not been available to me and to my family. Uh, until 1966. So I, I didn't do what loyal people did, who people like, I think Charles was a part of that first group that got together and they 
they mourn the loss. But in 1976, they sent out an alert to alum, alums across this nation that they had the addresses of. And I think, what was it, Charles? It was uh, how, 700? They sent out 150 letters and they got 700 people at the re first reunion. And, and they made a commitment that they would not let Christiansburg Institute die. And they began to collect photographs, yearbooks, van uniforms, artifacts. And the Alumni Association collection has roughly 4,000 items at this point in time. And it has all of the avenues to repositories that we have uncovering at Swarthmore College, which is the Freedmen's, uh, uh, Friends Freedmen's Association collection is there, the state of Virginia, uh, the Library of Congress. Uh, it's just uh, an amazing amount of material available that tells us how it came to be what it was. And that could not have been done with, with the attitude of this particular alumna. You know, because I just was too angry, too, uh, too, like the faith, like the faith. And, and uh, so when I came back and become, became involved and realized how much they had done, I was just euphoric. <laughs> I really could not do any, I did whatever they needed me to do for the most part, didn't I, Charles? <laughs> I'm laughing because I, I'm pretty hard to be told what to do sometimes. Where we are today, where we are today is the alumni founded the Christiansburg Institute in 1976. Uh, it, it recruited a board of directors that had the capability to uh, launch and to conceive of uh, well, actually to fulfill a concept that the alumni had worked through with a group of Virginia Tech faculty and administrators. And they came up with the conceptual map for the life of Christiansburg Institute. And they came up with the, the, the mission, which is to preserve the history of the school by communicating it to the world through a museum and to continue to build the archive. And the other was to bring its, its legacies of excellence, high achievement, and service to, be, to, bring, to bring it to bear on contemporary life again. So that was done before I came. All of this work was done, and I just walked in at the hot time when it was getting underway. Uh, where we are today is Christiansburg Institute Incorporated. Uh, is seated on base 4.4 plus acres of land uh, in the old traditional site. Um, there are three historic buildings on that campus and we have worked very hard and we are projecting a restoration of the campus by 2007, hoping to be in construction sometimes early to mid uh, 2006. But the image that you see, of course, is the first, it, this is uh, a replica of the smokehouse. And this was the first small parcel of land that, alumni, that was donated to the Alumni Association. And they were, they were gonna move the little smokehouse that was down on the farm campus and it crumbled. So they, they took the same design and that is the roof of the historic smokehouse that was on the campus. All of the farm buildings were attractive. They were all built by students, but the, the state-of-the-art building uh, crafts were taught and used and gave them the opportunities to, uh, to practice before they went out and became independently uh, employed. The other building on the campus that, that was also moved from the farm campus was uh, the shop building. This building was originally built in um, 1902 and uh, it did burn, and, but it was built back in the same form that it was. And that building uh, we're going to stabilize and restore. It's going to be an educational project, the restoration, and uh, it, we're going to secure a Virginia landmark for it. And finally, the building is that's still here, the classroom building, and it now is the flagship building of the campus, is the Edgar A. Long Building.
it's beaten up, but it's very it's solid. It's really solid. Uh, it's taken some beating now because there's some leaks and some of the roofing is failing, but uh, it, 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 it's going to be restored. It's going to look somewhat different because as you can see, the grating has covered up some of the, uh, some of the windows. Uh, on the north side, we, are, we don't have to uncover the windows, uh, but we will have a three-level building there that will house the archives, uh, a museum, a gallery, and uh, a computer interactive classroom and classrooms. Uh, we have, thanks to our architect who purchased 1.4 acres of land to the west of the Edgar A. Long, uh, and we will be uh, getting that, buying that land. We're going into contract for it uh, soon, and we will be buying that land for him. And we are constructing a brand new building called the Trades Learning Center. And we are going to bring the trading crafts into the educational program here for entry-level uh, entry employment, for advanced employment. And we're also going to pursue very elaborate uh, construction trades for renovation and historic purposes. So Christiansburg Institute has been refounded. I think the zeal, the energy, and the remarkable, the remarkable experience of it is so strong in the memory of some of us that we will try our very best to give all of you and the citizens of Montgomery County, the New River Valley, and well beyond the spirit the energy as you come to a refounded Christiansburg Institute um, to enjoy what it has to offer and bring to bear today. Thank you.